Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door bestows two basic options for Mario to travel with. His jump, and his hammer. Off of these two actions, Mario can go rather far, but what if you were to deny yourself use of one of them? Well, let's find out. Can you beat Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door without jumping? No. Of course not. Actually, I meant the jump attack for in battles, so basically, Mario can only use his hammer to attack enemies and fight bosses. With that in mind, the beginning of the game as we prepare to explore Rogueport does not really change enough for it to really matter whether or not you can only jump or only hammer, as both options do the same amount of damage to Lord Crump. Three uses of the hammer will do Lord Crump in. It would be two, but I plan on banning Super Guards in my challenge runs for this game. However, because of this, we need options to hit flying enemies, and there is no hammer move that can hit them for half of the game. I decided to leave the choice to my viewers to decide my fate on whether or not items or star powers would be banned, a mechanic will be introduced to soon. And my audience said they felt banning star powers would make the challenge harder. So, since we can use items, I just dropped 5 coins on a fright mask to make the one required fight in the sewers underneath Rogueport easy pickings. But not before hammering both the Goomba and the Spiky Goomba to benefit from the experience points they drop. Despite Parrot Goombas being out of reach for Mario's hammer though, first strikes a lawyer hammer to KO all the same. So making sure to do that would prove beneficial. Also, there are some item blocks up ahead, and one of them is holding a fire flower. Pick it up, it will be useful very soon. After a bit more travel, we make our way to the Thousand Year Door, and are sent on our way to properly start our adventure. We're also given Power Smash, which we use against the first robots in the game, the Blooper and Rogueport Sewers. Our hammer can reach the left tentacle, but not the right one. Once it's eliminated, we're essentially stuck as we're intended to either jump on the right tentacle or use Gubella's headbunk to reach it. Sounds simple, but I actually am not allowing myself to fight with my partners. I decided partners would make this challenge too easy for me, as it would just mean I didn't have to fight with my hammer once I got Yoshi or Gubella to a higher rank, so they're just not allowed to fight. Back to the boss though, I used the fire flower we found earlier to down the blooper. It does 3 damage, and in addition to 2 power smashes and a basic hammer attack, we're able to take him out, no sweat. Chapter 1 is finally here, and there are a number of fights to cover after traveling through the Petal Meadows and Petalburg. There are power blocks in Rata Schwank Fortress, and they are already going to be useful when dealing with bristles, enemies who cannot be approached with the hammer. Bottle Clefts may have the defense to weather out a normal hammer swing, but Power Smash cuts right through and can OKO just fine. I could have exhausted my second power block on the clefts by failing the quiz, but I did a demon to be necessary. After a little over a dozen swings with my hammer to wipe out the fuzzies guarding the sun and moonstones, the gold fuzzy came at us. He and his horde of fuzzies deal only one damage, so guarding is all we really need to come out of this fight still standing. Annoyingly, we have to take the horde out first before the gold fuzzy can be beaten, but at least winning this fight was still decently easy. With the way to Hooktail Castle now open for us, we venture through and engage the red bones blocking our path. Using items here was pretty much inevitable, so here is where I'd reason I'd use my power block to clear the dull bones. If the red bones spawn more in front of it, I just hammer again. If behind, I have a fire flower to save to finish it off. We got the former, and it meant getting a few more star points out of this fight, so I consider this a win, even if I took more damage than necessary. I went and headed back out after nearly reaching the end of the castle to pick up Last Sand from Mario, which I then used to challenge Gus. Above danger, I take 2 damage with a guard. Once I fall to 5 or less, guarding reduces damage taken to only 1, and with Power Smash being a 5 hit KO, we were sitting pretty. I did get bonked by a bucket, but despite missing once, I was allowed to dodge twice thanks to close call. Honestly, the fact Gus is considered spiky should tell you all you need to know. This fight is no different here than it would be for me in a casual playthrough, where I can't super guard. With one more level up gain that applies to my BP, let's discuss Hooktail. She's got 20 HP, an attack of either 4 or 5, and 1 defense. And those stats aren't going to see a reduction because I refuse to use Attack of XR. I reasoned that I didn't need a lot to win, but I may have been undercompensating just how much I really depend on Sweet Treat here. I do have a couple of mushrooms, a level over Fire Flower, which is basically as strong as Power Smash, and the life stream of things get particularly dire, plus my badges in Close Call, Power Smash, Last Sand, and HP Plus, as... Yeah, I lack confidence. And it doesn't take long to see just how justified the lack of confidence really was. I was also really banking on the mystery here, which, to be honest, I don't think I had a good reason to, but it was often just dead weight. Sadly, I'd often rely on the stopwatch to save me too, which, 
it turns out Hooktail's immune, so... Yeah. I really should have done my research here. As for the fight itself, it turned out that Power Smash really would only get us so far. At least when RNG wanted to have a hand in messing with me and block me with buckets when I already feel inadequately prepared. The lack of chances I had to deal damage did a lot of bad for my longevity, and without Sweet Trade, I can't just heal the dizziness either. So my first attempt was already off to a bad start. We can't get hooked to the lose for initial 20 HP, but my lack of FP and my low HP quickly caught up to me. And with my life stream already exhausted, it was a decisive defeat for us. Retrying the fight saw both my mystery and stopwatch be used, and both did essentially nothing. The mystery even just gave me a vault shroom, which is about the worst possible thing we could have gotten given on both bosses interactive electrify status. Really, we only won because despite my abysmal strategy, I at least know a thing or two about time bingos. And the mushroom bingo we got cancelled out the stopwatch I tried to use in vain. With the 11 HP left, we would have still perished despite good RNG coming from Hooktail's fire lowering us to 5 HP left, and in turn activating Last Stand. But we have mushrooms to get us back to a safe HP value, and we narrowly avoid death a second time. Not my proudest run through Chapter 1, but sometimes you just take what you can get. After clearing the first chapter, the way to Western Rogueport is now open to us, and this means money is no longer a concern. Using the Pianta Parlor to farm tokens, I'm able to afford some items Charlatan sells before they can be bought in shops like a boost sheet and a shooting star. He also sells the Hammerman badge, which I pick up and equip right away. Hammerman disables Mario's Jump Command in battle, but increases the power of his hammer by one. It's a terrible, terrible badge in general, as the hammer hits only once, while it jumps get it twice on a single enemy. And that's without factoring badges that allow you to hit even more than that. So instead of plus one damage, you'd get plus two. However, for the sake of this challenge, it's a free point of damage, so you really can't beat a deal like that. It's not even really a trade-off, it's just a significantly cheaper power plus. While picking up more badges along the way, we're just about ready to begin Chapter 2. Enemies here include Clefs, Pale Piranhas, and Dark Puffs. Pale Piranhas aren't of any concern, and Clefs may have high defense, but we're barely able to dent them thanks to Hammerman buffing our hammer. And thanks to Damage Dodge, they can't hurt us as our guards match the damage they deal to Mario, meaning we're perfectly safe against both of these enemies. Dark Puffs can be more problematic as they can fly in the air where we can't reach them, but they can choose to come down where our hammer can one-shot them. Quick Hammer is also found here, which basically will obsolete power blocks from now on in this challenge. On the return trip of the try and failing to get Flurry to help us, the Shadow Sirens are encountered, bringing us to our first quick fight in Chapter 2. And I'm not talking about Bell number rating Vivian either. But don't worry, next time, it will be her turn. Power Smash saw a lot of use being a 2 hit KO against Vivian, and it turns out Vivian can't fire Jinx turn 1, so she went out like a match. After she went down, Marilyn was next, and I just used a hammer and two power smashes to wipe her out. Also, as this was going on, the stage seemed to really want to get in on the action of Pounding Beldum I noticed. Normally I'd have to hit her twice, at least with power smash to win, but she was hit by two buckets and both back jumps fell on her, so by the time I can get the Beldum, I had to hit her with only one power smash before the last back jump took her out, and then the fight in my favor. Now that is slapstick. It's always funnier when it happens to someone else. Within the Great Tree, there are the invading x knots They're dispatched quickly thanks to both Power Plus and Hammerman, enabling my hammer to do 4 damage in a single swing. A shame I don't have the BP to crush them with Quick Hammer, but oh well. There's my reason to grind more later. Piders are also here to annoy us as we guide the punies through the tree, but they're no real threat. Just a quick damage dodge and weather them out as you squish them like the bugs they are. Unfortunately, yucks are enemies we simply cannot deal with. Any encounters where they exist, they're just narrowly out of range of our hammer. Even if we first strike, there is often at least one we're not going to be able to hit, so avoid a runaway whenever they appear. Real shame, really. Eventually, we challenge Lord Crump, who summons this mech, the Magnus One Grapple. This fight with only your hammer would be rather difficult, but items fortunately tend to trivialize any real possible challenge you could provide. The x fists don't have the HP to really sponge damage. We start with a few hammer swings before a power smash, leading to the x fist being deployed. Since I don't have the HP to survive being punched in the gut upwards of four times, now was an excellent time to drop my Fire Flower, which I've been saving since Shrunk Fortress. It wipes the x fist out of Magnus being left with only 15 HP left. Three power smashes later, and the super fighting robot shall fight no more. In case you were wondering what I'd do if I had to use star power instead, I'd simply use Earth Shummer instead to wipe out the x fists 
It's likely they'd be refired though, as my hammer is still at its base power, so I need to really sharpen my guards to not be pulverized. Finishing the fight quickly would also be more important, as my means of killing the X Fist is also fueled by what I use for my soul healing option, as I tend to avoid using happy hearts as I don't enjoy relying on RNG. Perhaps I could have instead relied on charge, damage, dodge, and sweet treat to KO and Magnus in one hit, so he just never gets the chance to play the X Fist, but let's be real here. No one enjoys seeing charge, and I hate using it. That's either here nor there though, so let's continue. We're not hit with much between chapters 2 and 3 though, so uh... Let's just talk about the glitch pit for a bit. A lot of enemies to fight here, and a good number of them are airborne. We don't have hammer throw yet, but we're allowed to use items here, so that's just what I did. If items were banned, I'd just be spamming the heck out of Earth Chamber when allowed, so there's largely nothing to really mention leading up to the actual bosses. And otherwise, we're plenty equipped to handle what's here to stand in our way. There's the obvious roadblock that is the Armored Harriers, but the added rule of not allowing partners to act can be broken just this once. And it is so that Yoji has to jump the gulp anyway. It's also in this chapter our hammer is upgraded, which is nice. Bowser was largely a waste of time. I honestly don't think I could justify talking about him here. As a matter of fact, expect me to just not talk about any more of the enemies in this game, since I really am not going to be fighting any more after Chapter 3, since we're soon after going to be primed to make some headway into the Pinnacle Bundle Trials. Rock Hawk, though, was a little more awkward, and I mean more than just his name. I didn't actually have a lot of items on me. Really, just a single mushroom which would not last long against someone who could jump to the ceiling and knock me off from max HP if I don't guard even one hit from his prop drop. Decided that HP Plus would help here a lot, and I went in with charge equipped since I don't like my odds of surviving the prop drop, so I'd hit him a bit, kept charging, and then just whacked him like a mosquito when my HP was at 1. Yes, I know, I denounced charge already, but it seemed like a fair option to avoid needing to otherwise bleed my FP dry with a below average Quake Hammer. Though if I really wanted to, investing in a Courage Shell would have helped considerably otherwise. He was defeated, and then I'd go after Macho Grubba who in preparation for, I bought a few Super Shrooms from the Pianta Parlor. As it turns out, despite having a job at the Glitch Pit being a fighter there, the wages just aren't that good. But I'm sure this was intentional on Grubba's part. Oh, Grubba. Underpaying your workers before Mimi made it cool. This calls for a revolution. It was an ultimately easy battle if you ask me though, as if ever my HP got low, I could just heal and the fight won't be too long regardless thanks to Power Smash being so meaty. You can probably guess by now that being able to use items in this challenge realistically would reduce a lot of risk concerning the chances of death. So the next few chapters really won't be worth talking too much about. I decided after finishing Chapter 3 to go into Chapter 4 and pick up the badge for Hammer Throw, giving me an option to hit airborne enemies. Then I went through the pit of one of the trials to stack Fire Drive, but was persuaded by my stream chat to also get the strange stack before exiting. As far as bosses in Chapter 4 go, I went ahead and battled Blanket Boy before he proceeded to Uno Reverse card me and took everything from me, including the clothes off my back. Wait, does this mean Mario is typically naked now? Well, anyway. I just did more fighting the journey through Chapter 4 and beat Atomic Boo with the recruiting Vivian. Speaking of her, expect a remake of her solo journey coming in the not so distant future. She's rather overdue for a touch up, I think. When it was time for fighting Duplass a second time, it was essentially the first fight in this challenge, with Phase 2 being the whole fight. About the best way I could put it, to be honest. His partners tried to hurt me, but they really couldn't hack it. Sadly, it seems like the same could be said for the rest of the game. Chapter 5 is here now, which was just putting out fires with my hammer and then smiting the King of the Pirates himself. And Cortez was pretty basic, all things considered. Basic hammer swings and a good grasp on basic guards carries very far here, and having a decent amount of defense made even Cortez's weapons child's play to deal with. Some items like a Courage Shell and a Mushroom did see play, but I could just as easily rely on Powerlift and Sweet Tree for similar effect. An easy battle to win for me, really. And same could be said for Lord Crump, though it's here where both Fire Drive and Hammer Throw became pretty important. The Exarch walked away to him, so I couldn't bash him directly. This means that for most of the fight, you need FP to actually progress. Zap Tap also works, but let's be real. No one in their right mind would just let Crump beat himself. That's just tedious. I didn't need items here, so let's move on. Chapter 6 is next, but before challenging some more Groovy getting on the train, it felt like a good idea to get double dip out of Rogue Port and some items specifically for the Chapter 6 boss. Mostly because I felt like I needed a means of countering the Miasmas that are spawned. 
Some earthquakes got a gradual syrup did the trick, and one of my super shrooms even got me to a safe HP value at where Smurf dropped me from max HP to peril, where then Quick Hammer and a meaty bash from my hammer was enough to close the fight out. Yeah, I do have a habit of overcomplicating things, but hey, a win is a win. After all, the alternative is just choosing Smurf with boost sheets. In case you were wondering, if I had to use star power here, not much would really change. I'd equip Flower Saber though, and possibly a Power Plus in addition to Hammer Man so the Miyaz was going to be one shot by Quake Hammer, and then take advantage of Power Lift as the added defense allows you to weather attacks more reliably. As for when the Claw comes out, you can easily just keep Mario's HP just above the way the attack would KO him and then fire off Quake Hammer's off Mega Rush, then heal out of peril with Sweet Treat to repeat the cycle. We really just haven't beaten from every angle, whether we're relying on items or star power. But with the availability of boost sheets as purchasable items now, it really becomes a lot less interesting on the item side of things, as we can just go wild on the remaining bosses if we really want to. And... yeah, that is exactly what I did. We otherwise aren't exactly equipped to deal with Magnus 2's X-Punches after all, and there are a lot of problematic fights in Chapter 8 to look out for. Of course, I can just limit myself to stuff like shooting stars and ultra shrooms if I really wanted to, but at that point, it'd just be more expensive than just using a few boost sheets while in peril to win fights quickly, which feels more inhumane than anything else, really. Not to mention that being able to use all the shooting stars I want would defeat the purpose of being restricted to my hammer, when with star power, I restrict my use of Pianta Parlor badges anyway, so super appeals would be limited, and I'd be forced to use my hammer anyway if my stop power got low, and I needed to regenerate it. I have heard some say I should ban both items and star powers, which isn't the worst idea in the world, but then I'd have to allow myself the super guard, and I know for a fact no one wants to see that. There is such a thing as being too restrictive, I think. Limiting myself to only items I found on the field would be better, while likely being possible thanks to my knowledge on certain glitches, but at that point, the challenge would barely be any different from a partner-only challenge, and I've already made seven of those, not counting any remakes. You likely would also enjoy seeing another challenge I'd done years ago given that, since my video and Mario fighting solo will be nearing exactly that, minus by using star power. And if I did allow myself to use such a partners, well, if you've ever seen what I can do with only Yoshi, you should know well what this would involve. And if I was satisfied with that standard, I'd still be making Pokemon challenges. Besides, I plan on tackling the pit of one of the trials after beating the game, and I'll definitely need to buy items for then. There's too much there to worry about to leave up to luck. In case you're wondering how Magnus 2 would go with star power, this is where the challenge would begin to really show its difficulty with not being allowed to jump. Mario's only good option to deal with the X-Punches is Earth Tremor, and your star power wouldn't regenerate fast enough to take the X-Punches out every other turn if necessary, especially with the audience cannon reducing the very means you have to regenerate it. You can still cheese Magnus 2 in spite of this, though, thanks to having access to two copies of both the Plus and Damage Dodge, alongside P down the up, and can just spam charge if you really wanted to alongside Sweet Tree to collect more FE to keep charging, but again, that'd be boring. Someone said, I'll just show you a flowchart. If you want to guarantee being able to beat Magnus 2 without partners or items while only using your hammer as an attack option, please refer to the description to see how much variance will be needed to account for to be prepared for every possible outcome. Or of course, you could just cheese this boss with charge and defense, but at least no, it's not necessary. Sadly, this is the last boss we'll see where this tactic would actually work. Why? Well, because the bosses in Chapter 8 have attacks that pierce defense, and damage dodge doesn't work in those attacks either. Dark Bones wouldn't be a big deal regardless thanks to defensive badges, power lift, and quake hammer, but after them? The challenge would truly become something scary. Fighting Gloomtail, it wouldn't be unreasonable to invest in more HP, so that when using Sweet Treat, you're given more of a buffer alongside feeling fine, so you can just choose to guard only on turn 1 and take 7 damage, then always take 8 damage every turn after, except for when Gloomtail hits certain HP triggers. Piercing Below also would be useful, since it cancels out Gloomtail's 2 defense, and is less taxing in your FP than Fire Drive. I won't talk about this fight much as it never happened, but I'll post in the description the surefire method to win, so you can at least see that this can be done with only star power as an option. What I will say here, however, is it definitely takes more thought than spamming boost sheets. The Shadow Sirens, meanwhile, aren't far behind, and are definitely more difficult to plan our winning strategy for because Marilyn's AI is entirely random, while both Duplus and Beldum are pretty much always going to attack directly and use Blizzard turn 1 respectively. 
this makes it impossible to reliably set Mario into peril in the middle of the fight, so relying on the rush back just isn't really an option. You're honestly better off just leaving it up to luck and giving Cluck out a chance to time the Shadow Sirens out. Failing that, you can otherwise just brute force this fight with a couple of damage dodges, all power boosting bags that's not named Jumpman or PFD down, maybe 50 HP max, and just wailing on them with like 3 fire drives and a supernova to blow them all out. Not really a hard fight. Huh. I forgot I super guarded that attack. But to be fair, if I had a life shroom, Beldum was already burned, and she died immediately after the super guard too. What can I say? I've never really been a big fan of sticklers. It's like what Sonic says, don't ask me why, I don't need a reason. As far as Grota, Spowser, and Kami go, I have a lot of advice to share. Making sure you are going to level up off of Grotus is on the top of that list. Once again, having two damage dodges here, and ideally a defend plus is actually pretty smart here as the badges will protect you from the Grotus X's damage, as well as Bowser's bite later. I'd also recommend Zap Tap for Bowser as a means of locking his AI into only using direct attacks so he can't pierce your defenses. Beating Grotus will involve alternating it between Earth Chamber and Fire Drive. Earth Chamber to expose Grotus, and Fire Drive actually hurts him and keeps him from attacking other turns to use it on him. If you pack Hammerman, All or Nothing, and your two Power Pluses alongside the earlier badges, alongside 25 max FP and whatever you have left onto HP, in my case 35 HP, you can do about 10 damage every two turns and win on turn 10 as long as you don't miss any guards. Of course, your Marvelous may vary if Grotus decides to use dodgy status, but there is really nothing you can do about that if it happens. Bowser and Kami are too bad after that, though. No doubt thanks to Earth Chamber replacing Hammer Flow's utility in Grumbling Kami Koopa and Fire Drop roasting both. They may be able to hurt you more quickly than Grotus if Kami decides to attack alongside Bowser, but only by about one damage. Yeah, it sounds more dangerous when you don't know the numbers, huh? So yeah, ultimately pretty tame. How about the Shadow Queen? Yeah, maybe it was a good thing I was told to use items. Safe to say, you don't really have any options to guarantee you win, so you're unfortunately going to just have to brute force this fight. I'd personally suggest investing enough attack to where your first hit of Fire Drive would do 7 damage, just so you can wipe out the left and right hands if ever necessary. Piercing Blow helps in case the Shadow Queen boosts her defense, and P down the up as you have only one real target while she can strike you multiple times in a single turn. Since you're like a partner as well, you can expect to see Mario be bombarded with damage, so you may actually get more value out of Sweet Feast this time around, alongside massively high HP. But alongside some art attacks early on, I wouldn't be too surprised if this was possible. I won't do it since I don't have to, but I think you can manage. Before we continue, I'd like to take the time to thank MD Switchy for being a channel member, and I'd urge you all to also join my memberships if you'd like to support what I do. Though, don't take this as an invitation to leave the video quite yet, because we still have the pit of one of the trials to do, so let's talk about it. I didn't know what I really need going into it, but I had the strange tech already, so I just gambled a bit for some piantas and bought some ultra shrooms and jab and jellies to get myself nourished whenever times got bad. I may have went a little bit overboard, but I always say better safe than sorry. I also brought a single life stream with me to keep myself safe in case I made a bad call or something, alongside a few booth sheets which really weren't likely to do anything. But I didn't feel like grinding more ultra shrooms, so it's just me versus the pit. And it actually didn't go too badly. The first 40 levels were just too little of a factor to truly be worth the hassle to talk about. Most enemies are one shot by fire drive, hammer floor proved to be great for parabuzzies, and my defenses otherwise were too high to truly worry about even the most strong attacks coming at me. And the various dizzy dials I saw while traveling downward really only mean less times I'd worry about damage because I had feeling fine to protect me. Going over the specifics for each 10 levels doesn't feel worth the effort as a result. So little so, whenever I found movers, I skip as many levels as I could. I didn't do this later on though. It's not wise to challenge Bone Tail with low HP, especially since I'm doing this challenge without super guards to fight just the stronger enemies and level up as much as I could. It wasn't until reaching the 40s where I started seeing star points being earned beyond the default 1, but my usage of movers slowed down a lot once I reached 50, so let's actually talk about the pit's enemies now. In the 50s, we encounter enemies like Ice Puffs and Dark Boos. They're not exactly strong, but their ability to gain height makes them obnoxious since Fire Drive can't reach them. Otherwise, we're not really hurting much, especially since now, we're actually leveling up which lightens the pressure of needing to heal. All in all, not very dangerous, though this calm starts to dissipate in the 60s. Now we're encountering Dark Cross and getting our first glimpses of Dark Wizards, which are examples of enemies who can either ignore Zap Tap 
or pierce our defenses and see sizable drops to our HP. The former are especially dangerous thanks to their high HP and our inability to rely on special moves like Showstopper to wipe them out quickly. The Hammer's limited hit, however, is still plenty usable enough here, though fights definitely feel slower. Hammer Throw definitely saw a lot of use for Dark Lakitus, for example, so it's still relatively mild. And that sentiment doesn't change for the 70s either. We meet more threatening enemies like Chain Chomps and regular Wizards, but there's also the often helpless Dark Koopa Trolls, who we can disarm super effectively with Quake Hammer, and Swoopulas, which cannot hurt Mario at all thanks to Zap Tap. There's very little to truly report thanks to the myriad of options available to us with all of our badges. Even without partners, Mario was plenty capable of holding his own. In the 80s, we finally start feeling genuine pressure. Spunyas, Piranha Plants, and Dark Bristles are all dangerous enemies with high attack stats, while Larantulas are gifted the property of not always being forced to the ground. Dark Bristles being impervious to fire also slows our progress of hitting enemies a lot. It's here I finally began to look to my items and started eating at my Ultra Shrooms. The damage is just too high, and keep in mind, I've been leveling up my HP nonstop since I entered the pit. Safe to say, I regret nothing. I can't say the pit hasn't been kind to me, though. Whether or not because I have the element of kindness or self-hold on my Wii U Game Pass for me to see the game, I will leave up to you. I will say, though, as I reach the 90s, I wish I thought to bring Fright Masks just in case I encountered Amazing Daisies. Though it ended up not mattering at all for better or worse since I never found a single one. I, however, did bring several shooting stars because the Elite Wizards worried me, and sure enough, both levels 91 and 95 each threw five of them at me all at once. So Foresight was definitely 2020. Otherwise, the only other enemy of note was Poison Puffs because of their damage being so gnarly. Being enemies that aren't restricted to the ground made the fight take longer than appreciated too. Otherwise, Bobbles were easy to decide to blow up immediately, and Swampires are about as scary as Fluttershy as a unicorn. So we were definitely sitting pretty. So pretty, in fact, I started using Hammer Throw because heck it, I'm not getting any younger. And before I knew it, we were finally just before Bone Tail. So surrounding those on Baba, I went out with my only FE Reliant Hammer badge just being Piercing Blow and Fire Drive. And with the extra BP I had, my swings allowed me to do upwards of 10 damage per turn, or even 17 if I managed to stumble into peril. Believe it or not, I did. And it was glorious. The damage was pretty hefty, as to be expected when your opponent can repeatedly pierce your defenses with his Dragon Breath, but when you're stuffing your face with Ultra Shrooms, it's difficult to feel truly threatened. After almost two hours of enduring the pit, the fight with Bone Tail lasted around eight minutes, which feels rather emblematic of this whole challenge, actually. Stick a fork in it, Hammerman Mario alone is just about done. Wish I had more to say, but I guess I should let my other videos speak for me. For now, I'd say to check out my series of partner-only challenges. I'd say Vivian's run would be worth checking out, and in the future, expect you to see a remake where we get to see how much better she is when being piloted by someone competent. Thanks for watching, I'll see y'all later.